conversation of options for becoming best friends forever. Where we left off, I want to begin by talking about where we left off last week, the future of community behavioral health systems of care. And in that session, you'll remember that I talked about think about it. You become best friends with health plans. You have to become best friends with health plans, pitching that you can help them bend the cost curve for the most complex enrollees. And you also have to become best friends with primary care systems, helping them deal with their most complex patients. And you also have to become best friends with all of the other providers in the health neighborhood. And now you have to become best friends forever with other behavioral health providers. So that's, that's one of the, the um, slides that we left things with. And then the second slide that I want to just use as a connection to this webinar is the conclusion from this, which is what are the options for becoming best friends with the new ecosystem? And we talked about those options being becoming part of an ACO, becoming part of a behavioral health ACO, becoming part of a behavioral health network, becoming part of a behavioral health association, which is a looser set of connectivity than a network, which is not a risk, and neither of those are risk-bearing entities like an ACO, or becoming an acquisition target for a larger health system, merging with one of our behavioral health providers, and also doing one of the above or not. So with those little memory joggers in mind, I want to talk about today's agenda. It's, it's actually um, pretty short. Uh, Part, I want to start with a brief conversation about partnering in antitrust, which uh, should be the beginning of any conversation that you have around partnering. Um, and then I want to spend most of the time today talking about what is an ACO and how is it supposed to achieve the triple aim, connected with the third topic of where does the safety net delivery system fit into this new health ecosystem. Now, um, I suspect that we're going to use the full time for these first three topics. And so what I've decided to do is push the second half of this conversation into the new year, into January, where we'll be covering what are, are less than full meal deal options to consider and how does one decide which direction to take. So um, I made the decision that if we spend a good amount of time digging into what an accountable care organization is, how it acts, well, to see, that's like a five-day training. And so, um, or at least a whole full-day session. So we're going to spend the full time talking about that. And then that, that will help us think about the, the um, less full meal deal options in our next webinar. And we're going to spend a little bit more time today taking breaks and having you talk about, think about what kind of questions or comments that you want to make. So let's jump right in and talk about partnering in antitrust. There's a really exciting dynamic out there, um, and it's been going on since CMS began pushing ACOs as one of the key strategies to fix the healthcare system in the U.S. And that is that the U.S. Justice Department, very concerned, has been concerned, continues to be concerned about antitrust issues that arise when an organization is doing the same type of work in the same geographic area, band together to inhibit competition. So, okay, so the feds are wanting providers to come together to help achieve the triple aim, and the feds are not wanting providers to come together to be anti-competitive. It's a pretty important um, dynamic that we want to just spend a few minutes talking about. So there's been a bunch of where it took the first couple of years that the Medicare ACO regs got pushed out and providers are coming together to create ACOs. The feds 
didn't come out with any definitive policy statements about um, to try and resolve this dynamic. But fortunately, we're beyond that. And there has been um, a fair amount of stuff that's come out. And, and so I want to talk about the six, as I say here, federally identified characteristics of reasonably related agencies. So that's an interesting technical term. And what the feds basically said is, is there are situations where um, you can be reasonably related and you'll be able to substantially avoid um, problems with antitrust. So let's take a look at them. Uh, the ACO will, so this is like really, let's see, let me, be, before I go into the six, let me just say that this is about, if you're working to achieve the triple aim, uh, then that's great. If you're doing something other than that, then it's probably, it's potentially antitrust. So you'll promote accountability for the quality, cost, and overall care for a target population, which is one of the definitions of an ACO. You'll evaluate the health needs of the members of the ACO. You'll manage and coordinate the care for clients and patients. Now, we haven't quite defined what an ACO is, even though I know that all of you have, you know, lots of different exposure to that. Um, but so this, this will make maybe a smidge more sense after we cover Chapter 2, but I think it's okay to start with this. Um, the ACO will invest in infrastructure and redesign care processes for high-quality and efficient services. The ACO will communicate clinical knowledge and evidence-based medicine to clients and patients. And the ACO will develop standards for client-patient access and communication. So if you think about it, this is a pretty actually, this is actually a pretty awesome list. Um, and, and it's kind of really cool guidance about any providers working together to try and be part of the solution, um, these are things that ought to be on the list. But let me say that any partnering work is going to require lawyer help. Um, and I'm not a lawyer. Uh, Walter Saib is on the call who works with me today. Uh, he's not a lawyer either. Um, and as you, however you come together to work together, this is going to be important. Let's see. Um, I've got a little note that says the organizer is experiencing technical difficulties. Unless the organizer rejoins, the meeting will end in five minutes. So um, let's just go to the next slide. In the first question, there, there's actually two questions. I want to see if you have a, if there are questions or comments. But but um, let me just stop and let's do a check-in. Um, with the people that are on the call, are you seeing slide seven? And can you hear my voice? Can you unmute yourselves and just let me know that? Because I don't want this recording to stop on us. Yeah, yeah things look fine on, on my end, Dale. OK. They look fine over here. This is bunk. OK, super. That's great. That's all I need to know. Yes, great. Thanks. So question um, for the group, as you've been um, Working together as an alliance, has there been any discussion or has the topic of antitrust come up at all with you? Yes. And could you just hum a few bars about um, what that con what those conversations, uh, the gist of those conversations? Uh, there have been rudimentary, really, discussions. And I, I appreciate your, your comment around seeking legal consultation, but uh, what well, all that we uh, have been doing is sharing information, um, especially since, uh, oh gosh, for the last several months, it's all about learning about the RHA, uh, learning about early adopter, learning about um, how to work with the HMOs. Uh, so it's all been educational. Um, and then when we've tried to form as an, a, a new alliance, so this is just in the last six months, what our work has been, we've 
we've been cognizant that um, that we need to be careful. Uh, we can't be involved in anything that would um, involve some some type of uh, price fixing or uh, you know talking about contracts uh, in, in in a way that would suggest that we're interested in doing that. And to kind of uh, avoid going down that road, what we're trying to do is uh, relate to the work and the guidance that you've given us around becoming uh, mental health centers of excellence. Uh, when we par you know participated oh, about a year ago in a webinar with you, that's kind of been our direction. And what we've been talking about is really trying to learn as much as we can. And I'll shut up now and let other people talk. Maybe you covered it all. So, so what you said is great. No problems there. And as you move forward, um, it will be important to to uh, get get assistance around this. Other comments? Okay. So let, let's go on to chapter two. So the reason why I have a unicorn slide as the cover slide for Chapter 2 is when ACOs first um, hit the scene, there were, there, was, there were some clever people who uh, did blogging and article writing in the healthcare space who said uh, the uni the AC an ACO is like a unicorn. Everybody can describe one, but no one has ever seen one. And it was really, it, you know, everybody, it, it was good for a good laugh. But I just, um, I just said, wait a minute. That's not accurate. Uh, I can, I can, I, I've seen an ACO. Uh, it's Kaiser. I've seen an ACO. It's Group Health. And, um, and there have been ACO, so Group Health started after World War II. It's been around for, you know, decades and decades. And, and, and with people, but, but that said, um, there's an important distinction that I'm going to, I want to talk about in the next couple slides, uh, because Kaiser and Group Health aren't the only models of an accountable care organization. So let's, let's spend a couple minutes talking about this, um, drill down into it. Uh, I have some questions I want to ask you, and then um, we'll see where that takes us. So what we know is that many people in healthcare believe that the, old, the holy grail for achieving the triple aim is an integrated health system uh, where there's global capitation to an accountable system of care. So the, so the box that's on the screen that's represented by the diagram is, um, is Kaiser or it's Group Health. Inside the integrated health system, uh, there's a health plan that's part, of the org that's part of the organization. So Kaiser has a health plan. Kaiser has health care homes pr slash primary care clinics where the, the Providers and the staff are part employees of the system. They have specialty clinics. Uh, they have hospitals. It's basically everybody is working for the same organization under one roof. And uh, they're working together theoretically to achieve the triple aim. And um, what we know is that this model, while not perfect, has a better chance of achieving coordinated care than the, the model where you have fragmented providers that aren't connected in any way, that aren't working together. They're getting paid separately from payers, and they're not getting paid when, by the payers when, when the providers talk to each other to try and coordinate care. Unfortunately, integrated health systems represent only 10% of the U.S. health delivery system. So 
when people started trying to figure this out, they didn't say, oh, well, we're going to just make everybody, we're going to have, we're going to have HMOs again, and everybody's going to become a member of an HMO that's an integrated health system where everybody, all the providers are working together. I mean, we've already tried to go down that route, and the American public said, we're not interested in that model, that system of care. And so an ACO is an attempt to figure out what to do <coughs> about organizing the delivery system for the other 90% of the population that doesn't sign up with an HMO. So that's a so so for me, an AC there's two kinds of ACOs. There's ACOs that are part of a single entity like Kaiser, and there are ACOs that are made that are made up of multiple organizations that are acting Kaiser-like, if you will. So the big question that's been on the table is, are accountable care organizations of that second flavor um, the entity that's going to save us? And if you look at the little diagram here, you can see that there's no health plan inside the health plan's been moved outside the entity, the integrated system of care. And what's happening is that you've got the delivery system that's organized through this entity called an accountable care organization. And you have all the same players um, that are inside the box working together, contracting separately with health plans. The, and so, um, by definition, they're provider groups that accept responsibility for the cost and quality of care delivered to a group of patients that are cared for by the ACO clinicians. And the ACO, they're the organizing structure to help health homes coordinate care with specialists, hospitals, and other parts of the delivery system. So there's, there's an important comment there about the, there needing to be infrastructure and they manage financial risk. So money flows from the payers to the ACO, generally via capitation, sometimes case rate. Um, and in the early days, um, the, actually the most typical model has been, we're still going to pay you fee for service, but we're going to pay you. We've come up with a formula that if we save money, if the health plan saves money, we'll share it with you, with the idea being that we want to create financial incentives for the providers to do more than paying, getting paid on volume. But uh, we, want, we really want to get the delivery system, the signals right to pay for value, not just volume. So in, in the spirit of that, ACOs manage the new payment models to providers that incentivize prevention, early intervention, and supports to, for persons with complex and costly health conditions, especially. So. Um, there's two parts of how the money flows. How does the money flow from the health plans to the ACO? And then once the money gets into the bank account of the ACO, how does the money flow from that bank account to the providers who, in the case that I'm talking about today, work for multiple organizations um, as opposed to one organization? And so that's an important piece of the puzzle that, that um, you have to think about the wiring of both sets of money flows. So for example, if you all uh, were part of an ACO in Southwest Washington, whether it's a whole health ACO or a behavioral health ACO, uh, generally you would get paid by the health, by the Medicaid health plan. So let's just talk about Medicaid for a moment. And then you would decide how to allocate that money to the providers in the network. And uh, you could use fee-for-service, you could use case rates, you could use subcapitation, you could use some a method of allocation. And I'll be talking about what they did up in North Sound with the five counties up there as we go through this as an example. But, but I'm going to put a bookmark in that for just a moment. So um, because before I, I go there, I want to talk about how these things get started. 
as you've probably heard me say a few times, all healthcare is local. And what we know is that ACLs are being organized all around the country. There's several hundred of them right now. They're probably up to 1,000 ACLs in the US right now by a bunch of different kinds of organizations. And so let's take a look at some of um, the organizations that are coming together that have already come together to create ACOs. So I've already said this, uh, integrated delivery system, one or more hospitals and large groups of employed physicians that often have insurance plans. So Kaiser, they have aligned financial incentives. They have advanced health IT in many cases including electronic health records, um, and hopefully they have well-coordinated team-based care. So Group Health, where uh, Walter, my colleague Walter, uh, used to work, most recently worked, um, uh, that describes Group Health, um, where it's a large system of care that has an insurance plan, and they've been working for many decades to improve care. Um, we also see that there are multi-specialty group practices that have come together to create ACOs. So that there's examples of that around town, around the Seattle area, as well as many, many in California. Uh, what you'll see is strong physician leaderships, contracts with multiple health plans, and they've developed mechanisms for coordinated care. Um, and so in this case, we have... Um, you'll see that it says multi-specialty group practice in the singular as opposed to the plural. So it's one organization without a hospital that has come together and created their own ACO. They have to be large enough. Um, the Medicare ACO regs say that you have to have 5,000 patients who are fee-for-service Medicare to get um, approved. Medicare has a whole ACO program that they've, they've been running for a few years now. And you have to have 5,000 patients who are Medicare and who are in Medicare fee-for-service versus managed care to be able to sign up. So these are pretty large organizations. And then there's this thing called the Physician Hospital Organization. And we're starting to move from single organizations to multiple organizations coming together where we have a joint venture between one or more hospitals and physician group, generally physicians groups. And as it says here, you can see that it, fo it could focus on contracting with payers to functioning like a multi-specialty group practice. And it's, you know, it really requires focus on clinical integration and care management because what we have is multiple organizations that are pl trying to play well in the same sandbox. And then uh, the fourth model, and, and these may sound similar, but they're actually quite different, is the Independent Practice Association, where you have individual physician practices, multiple individual physician practices, that create a corporation or partnership that come together, they call themselves an IPA uh, generally, um, and then they create an ACO. And so um, as I think about the conversation with you, if you were to create a risk-bearing entity and call it an ACO, whether it's with health providers and yourselves or just behavioral health providers, um, this is one of the versions where you would basically be pulling multiple practices together, creating a new entity. and, and this and the next one is what I'm going to be digging down into in, in the next few slides. And then finally, there's a regional collaborative, which is similar to the Independent Practice Association, but an IPA by historically has been physician practices. And so the closest thing to what you all would be thinking about is the um, uh, the people that are the Brookings, Dartmouth Brookings ACO Institute, the, this is information from them. They would describe you as a regional collaborative that you're considering being, where it's independent or small providers. Um, the provi there's providers, medical foundations, nonprofit entities, state governments. Um, so there's a lot of players beyond 
medical treatment organizations that are involved in this. And so the reason why I went into the slide is to say that, like, if you were thinking, you know, I brought up this idea of becoming a behavioral health ACO, and people might go, well, that's not an ACO. Um, how could you have a behavioral health? It doesn't fit the definition of an ACO. And what I'm saying is that there's, there's several different flavors of ACOs. And so it's really important when someone starts talking to you about ACOs to not think of it as a single monolithic. It has to look exactly this way. And there's a group called Hill Physicians in California that's a very large IPA. And they've been doing managed care contracting for 30, more than 30 years in California. They've had contracts continuously over that period of time. And when the Medicare ACO regs came out, they said, we're we're not. Um, we're going to create our ACO, and we're not. We're, let me make this very clear to you: we are not going to let hospitals be part of our ACO because hospitals are the secure system, and we're, we, quite frankly, are trying to disrupt hospital. How much money is going to hospitals? And if we let them in under the tent, then um, then uh, we're dead. We don't. We're not able. We won't be able to bend the cost curve. So. That was an interesting decision that they made that helps underscore that many ha many ACOs are started by hospitals, but many are not. I'm gonna there's a there's like a few more slides that I want to talk about, and then I and then I have some questions for you, and I want to see what questions you have for me. So ACOs are legal entities. However you slice it on the previous page, um, ACOs have contracts with health plans. Or if they are, if they have their own health plan, they have contracts with employers and, and, and state governments, the Medicaid authorities and Medicare. Um, and to, do, to help to hold those contracts, of course, they have to be a legal entity. And the most common form is a, uh, of the ACOs made up of multiple organizations is a limited liability company that's owned by the entities that organize the ACO and, uh, and then their invitees. In other words, what I mean by that is there's generally a core, a founding group of organizations that start the ACO. And then as they become more mature, they develop standards for who they want to have inside their organization to help them work together, not to do anti-competitive price fixing, but to meet those six criteria and help achieve the triple aim. And so here's a little example of, a, of what, one of the models, the hospital physician ACO, where there's the hospital, there's the physicians. And in this, they kept it simple so that um, there was one hospital and one multi-specialty physician's practice. You can see that you can see that um, that below the line, there's a couple of X's with a percent sign, which is basically saying uh, there's a, di a decision that's made up front about how much each entity uh, owns what percentage of ownership that they have, and then what percentage of return that they have if there's any proceeds to be distributed to the owners. Now, what's interesting about this example is they've created a management company, an LLC management company. That's what they've called it. And so this is actually the legal entity. And the legal entity is owned by a hospital, by physicians, and but they don't in this particular example, which is a very common example, they didn't hire a whole ton of people to do all the things that the man, a managing entity does. What they have is a management contract with a with a, another company, um, and so there's base management fees, and then they reimburse them for expenses, and then they have a whole incentive program, and um, and basically, the management company that's an already existing entity 
um, provides administrative services to the ACO providers. And then there's a formula for equity return. And in this case, they have two classes, class A physicians and class B hospitals. So this, this is a typical example. There's 20 or 30 different variations on it. But it's good to sort of think about that if you're creating a, a real, and so I started this whole conversation with wanting to do a little bit of digging into what a real ACO looks like so that then we can um, look at what scaled back versions are by taking certain pieces away, we create something less than a full meal deal ACO. And in this case, what would happen is that this ACO would have contracts with commercial health plans, with Medicaid health plans, with Medicare, people would um, pick their primary care doc. Um, so, so like if I picked my primary care doc and that primary care doc was, was part of this ACO, then I would be attributed to that ACO. And, um, and that would start the process of figuring out whether Dale's health is getting better, whether Dale's care is uh, costs are growing at a faster rate, um, at the same rate that they would have been if I wasn't in an ACO, or if they're growing at a slower rate, or they're even going down, that generates the savings to the providers, to the ACO. So there's a bunch of um, words here, but this is this is kind of how I want to spend a few minutes talking about how, um, what happens after you create the company. So there's this thing called patient attribution. And I, I'm going to read this because it's important to adding a few comments. So patients are assigned to an ACO if they receive the plurality of non-inpatient care from that provider within a recent historical period. And um, so the ACO is responsible for all the costs and quality of care delivered to patients attributed to providers who are exclusively members of that ACO. So let me unpack that a little bit. Let's just pretend for a minute that you became part of an accountable care organization that had, um, that was already existing, and it had a contract with Medicare to be a Medicare share, a fee-for-service ACO. Um, basically, um, the way that this would work is um, Medicare, uh, these people are in fee-for-service, they can go wherever they want. Let's just say that there's um, 20,000 fee-for-service Medicare enrollees in the three-county region that you guys are in. And, if it, um, and let's say that 6,000 or 7,000 of them uh, use the primary care services um, of the providers inside this ACO, then they would, they don't have to literally sign up. They would be what's called attributed because what Medicare does is they, they look at all the fee-for-service patients in, in Southwest Washington and they go and they look at all the claims and they pull out the hospital claims and they say, um, uh, did, I'm going to call this ABC ACO. How many of these 20,000 Medicare people actually um, received most of, uh, more than 50% of their care from ABC ACO. And oh, there were 70, there were 8,000. Then those 8,000 people will be attributed. They'll be patients of ABC ACO whether they actually know it or not. That's how the Medicare program works. Um, Medicaid in Washington hasn't designed their ACO rules yet, um, but they could they could use that path, or they could what they could do is they could say, people if people want to sign up with ABC ACO, then they would sign up with ABC ACO. That would be their medical home. So you pick your medical home, and that whatever ACO that medical home is in then that patient becomes part of that ACO. And then you as behavioral health providers would be part of that team that would, where the math is being computed to determine whether there's savings for the 8,000 people 
that are in that ACO or whatever the number is. Um, let's see, I'm going to stop right now. I'm, I'm going to ask you to go off and do a little exercise in just a couple minutes, but I want to stop right now to see if what I said is like totally die, you know all this, or if it's clear as mud and you have no idea what I'm talking about, or if, you, if you're somewhere in between and um, you think you're, you know, you get it, but maybe you have a couple questions. So I'm going to go into a cone of silence for 30 seconds. And then um, I'm going to ask you if you have any questions or comments at this point before I go into the ACO budget development. Let's see, can you see my watch? Any questions or comments? Hey, Dale, it's Bunk. I have a question for you. Sure. So in the example you've given with ABC ACO, mm -hmm. you used um, primary care a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, were you doing that just to give a tangible example of how it works on the primary care side? or? Are you alluding to an ACO that includes primary and behavioral health care as a potential um, LLC ACO um, or both? Yeah, good. So generally speaking, that's a great question. Um, as, as I said, the idea of cons we want to think about the idea of considering a behavioral health ACO, and if you do create that. Um, it would be a little bit, um, uh, it would be a non-standard ACO. And, uh, and, uh, and we'll be talking about that more today and then more next week as we go into some of the other alternatives, or then next week, but after, after the holidays when we do our next webinar. But generally speaking, um, most people that are creating ACOs think about an ACO where primary care is the center of the universe, and every and um, and who your primary care provider is determines what ACO you're part of, and all and, the, and but it takes a village. So the ACO ACOs generally have. Behavioral health providers working in the primary care clinic. They have specialty behavioral health providers. They have cardiologists and endocrinologists. So they have specialty medical providers. Uh, they have hospital providers. But the the um, the primary care is the center. If, if for most ACOs that are working well, the medical home or the health home is is the focus of Care coordination, cost curve bending, um, chronic care management, prevention services, and so so that's why I use that example because that's the center. That's the ideal, the currently ideal center of the universe. So if you created a behavioral health ACO, what you would be doing is saying here's Here's what I'm going to take responsibility for. Remember that an ACO takes responsibility for the quality and cost of the care, and you would you would basically say these are the services that we take responsibility for. These are the services we want to be subcapitated for, and it would at a minimum it would need to look like what's the nine core services and what a certified community behavioral health clinic is, including care management. Um, screening and monitoring and management of chronic health conditions so that you would have people who were, so the center of the care coordination would be happening inside your organizations um, or you really couldn't be a behavioral health ACO. But I, but so, so we're going to, we're going to figure out, we're going to talk through um, the differences between a medical ACO that includes behavioral health and a behavioral health ACO that doesn't 
include anything more than medical care management. So, so I was, I didn't give you that breakout, but that's that's where, what I was alluding to when I was giving that example. Did you? So, uh, do you have any follow-up comments or questions, Bunk, about what I just said? And if you if you don't. Um, uh, if We're you still, think thing, still processing ahead. here, Dale. Okay, good. So, so I guess I guess what we're teasing out of that is, it'd be a new version of an ACO that's more behavioral health net. I don't want to use words that confuse things here, but behavioral health oriented, um, but could have an association or with some sort of primary care. Yeah. Yeah, so, so let me hum a few more buyers about that. So Joe wrote in and said, it looks like we as a group need to start connecting with primary care providers and other medical providers to form an ACO. Um, maybe, uh, maybe, and the other alternative is for you to, to, um, to go to the, is to, okay, so let me just paint a few brush strokes. And I'll write. I'll have this written up, and we'll be looking at it and talking about it more in our next webinar. So let's pretend that um, that we were we're uh, a year into the future, and you decided to go a different route. You decided to create a behavioral health um, ACO, or you might not call it an ACO. You might call it an IPA. You'll you'll figure out what what words. Um, I remember that term IPA, Independent Practice Association or Provider Association. Um, but whatever it is, what you want to do is you want to go to the Medicaid health plans and you want to say, here's a bundle of services that we want to take responsibility for. And that includes all the behavioral health services, including crisis and in, 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 in psychiatric inpatient and residential and um, all the outpatient ambulatory behavioral health services. And um, for people that have behavioral health disorders and chronic health conditions uh, that want to use us for their care management will be their their behavioral health home, uh, a la the Missouri model, where we have care manager, or the Kitsap mental health model, where we have care managers in our clinic and they're taking responsibility. And so you'll basically, Medicaid health plans will negotiate with you a uh, rate so that you'll basically pass your behavioral health premium that you get paid for from the health care authority, you'll take an administrative piece off and you'll pass the rest of the premium down to us and we'll create a risk sharing arrangement so that we, if we have catastrophic expenses, um, we'll have, we won't go broke, we'll, we'll figure out, we'll do some kind of reinsurance process, but we'll just, we'll go at risk for the behavioral health portion in the same way that in a similar way that the RSN has gone at risk. And that's a complete, but, but we'll take it one step further because we will do more than just what the RSN is promising. We will do medical care management for people that want us to be their behavioral health home, which is a really big difference from what the RSN does now. And it actually is an important way to bend the cost curve. So, so that's a completely reasonable, if you can, a uh, way for you to um, put yourself out there in terms of helping achieve the triple aim. And, and, and let's, I'm going to call that a behavioral health ACO for the moment. But for you to do that, you will not succeed unless you become best friends with the primary care providers, so that and um, and and a number of specialty providers that are that do high volume work with with your with your clients, um, probably cardiologists and endocrinologists are are the two biggies. So 
So there's a, a really great question. Where do you see the Washington State Health Home Programs fitting into the bigger picture of this? So, Sai. So Washington State Health Homes um, were designed before the current administration the, the, uh, came into office and designed before uh, Dorothy Teeter became head of the health care authority. And um, the, the, there's, a, there's a fair amount of controversy around the health home model because um, it's a model where there's contracts that are given to organizations that, that aren't uh, the health home for the patient. Uh, but instead, it's a third party, and um, that third party is supposed to connect with the patient and then connect them with their primary care clinics. Um, and there's a wide variation in terms of the success of this model around the country and in the state. And it's working for some people. It's not working for others. And there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of hand-wringing at the state that if, if we wish we had been um, running the show before this health home model rolled out because we never would have done it this way. So I'm, I'm predicting that the health home model is either going to get um, expanded so that there's more, there's more, there's not just that one model that's being used or um, or blown up and, and replaced with a more traditional health home model, and um, and so, but I don't, you know, I don't have um, a good crystal ball about that. But that that's what my prediction is. So I think the health home model that exists now is going to morph into something um, that looks different than what it does now. So I'm going to talk about a couple more slides, and then I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise, if you will. Um, so patients get attributed in some way, shape, or form, either if they're Medicare fee-for-service ACL, there's this whole, uh, after the fact, let's see where the most visits were. If uh, In many Medicaid ACOs, the patients actually sign up with the ACO for that, for the medical home, a medical home, and then that medical you know, who their primary care provider is, and then based on the, if that primary care provider is part of an ACO, then that patient is part of the ACO. It's sort of like the Verizon model where you pick your, your primary care provider and you have a whole army of folks supporting you. So then what happens is there's a budget development process happens where, where the actuaries actually take, let's just say that there's 8,000 people that are in this full meal deal ACO as opposed to behavioral health ACO, just to continue my example. They, they look at the historical claims for those 8,000 people, and they say um, uh, how much service did they get in the past, what was the cost of the service. Um, they do trend estimates based on the age and the chronic health conditions of those 8,000 people. Um, if they got the same kind of care next year and the year after and the year after that they got this year and last year, um, how much will their health care costs go up? And then they make some adjustments. So these are actuaries who are doing this. And they make adjustments to, to uh, as it says here, to ensure actuarial reliability, to basically say this is what we. So we think that, let me just give you an example. We think that we ran the numbers, and for those 8,000 people, the average per member per month cost uh, this year was $500 per person for their, all their the hospital, specialty, medical specialty, behavioral health, primary care. Uh, that group has been growing. Those 8,000 people, their costs have been growing at 10% a year, just to use a round number. So, so next year, uh, we think if all things being equal, it would go from 500 to five. $150 per person per month. But Medicare inflation has, sh has slowed down, so we think it'll only grow 8%. So uh, it's going to be $540 is what we're saying. And so the, the, so what they're saying 
is for the patients that are attributed to you, uh, we're expecting, if you do nothing different, we're expecting that you, the cost, the average cost for those patients will be $540 per person per month. So hold that number in mind. I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about how this would relate to behavioral health ACO in just a moment. So once the budget is finalized, um, the ACO sets up a report, a set of reports that monitors the actual costs. Think of that 540 average and, and then compare and monitors what it's really costing and compares them to the budget, that budget of $540. And there's all sorts of payment incentives and payment arrangements. And, uh, and, and so one of the models is we'll pay you fee for service. And, uh, and since your ACO has a hospital and specialists and, and everybody else, we'll pay you on a fee for service basis. If the patient goes elsewhere, um, outside the network, we'll have some rules around that and we'll pay those providers and we'll total everything up. And let's just say that next year your co the cost for those patients ended up being $520 instead of $540. So you save $10 per person per month, so that's $120 a year times 8,000 patients. Now that, that's a pretty good chunk of money. Um, we're going to skip we're going to split that money 50-50. We're going to give you a, a, a check for half of that savings, and we're going to keep the other half. That's how the Medicare, um, if you, oops, there's one more piece. If you meet, um, there's a set of quality standards, and you have to meet the quality standards in order to get paid, um, in order to get your check. So. So the Medicare ACO model, the fee for service is we pay you fee for service on the front end. We compute the savings. We we compute whether you hit your quality measures. If you do, we give you a check for half of the savings, and we keep the other half. The other half goes back into the Medicare trust fund in this case. Or we could pay you a capitation payment with a withhold, and um, so. So there's, there's a handful of different models that I, that I won't go into more of the details around that now, but that, that's kind of how those wheels turn. And of course, this, this simple little piece of patient attribution, developing the budget, performance monitoring, and then figuring out how the, what, the, what if there are savings and how the incentives get paid out is all supported by the following playbook where the ACO has to be doing something different than care as usual, because if care as usual played out, it would be $540 of costs or more, and there would be no savings and there would be no bonus. So the first, um, this is from Harold Miller, who has been doing a lot of great work on health care payment reform. And so he starts out by focusing on what primary care practices can do. And so he's listed four things that we've talked about, that you've talked about. If you're a behavioral health home, uh, this is very relevant to you as well. Improve prevention and early diagnosis, improve practice efficiency, um, getting people, if you're a behavioral health center of excellence, there's a lot of efficiency pieces going on there. Reduction in unnecessary testing and specialist referrals and reduction in preventable emergency room visits and admission, admissions. So that's what the primary care side, that's what the behavioral health home folks are doing, is they're keeping people out of the emergency room and out of the hospital when they don't need to be there. They're actually, they're also helping reduce unnecessary tests and referrals to specialists, and they're working on helping keep people healthy. And they're improving the efficiency. On the hospital side, they're, the hospitals and specialists are also part of the ACO in my whole meal deal ACO picture. And so they get a bonus, too, if they improve the efficiency of care. They use lower cost treatments. They prevent 
uh, infections um, and medical errors, other medical errors. And they also keep people um, from having to come back to the hospital because um, they didn't get good aftercare when they left the hospital or they didn't have bad things happen, like a person getting an infection when they're in the hospital causing them to come back. And together, they're working on improved management of complex patients. They're helping keep people out of the high cost settings and they're lowering the total health care costs. And because there's so many, there's so much waste, there's so many examples of where people aren't having these things done, there's a huge opportunity for improvement in just about any place in the whole country. And so, so what's happening inside an ACO is they're doing all of these things. They're, they're pulling all of these levers. They're turning all of these wheels. And, um, and so what they're getting is the ACL formula, which is they, you organize the delivery system to work together. You focus on high quality patient-centered care, including um, the things that are in this little picture. You build the infrastructure to support this effort. You change the payment model to support this effort. You monitor progress and embed continuous quality improvement, and you end up achieving triple aim for the ACO members, including um, saving money, uh, which then becomes a bonus for the ACO. And then if you're doing a behavioral health ACO, you're not taking the risk for the inpatient medical inpatient and medical specialists or, or any of the health care costs, but what you're doing is you're working to lower those things because of the cool things that you're doing around care management, and you're also getting a similar kind of bonus related to that. So um, actually what I'd like to do now is um, ask you to take just a couple minutes and if you're in a room by yourself, um, just maybe put a mirror up. And if you're in a room with other people, um, talk. To, just I'm gonna I'm gonna just um, go on silent for five minutes, and I'm gonna ask you to um, answer. Let's actually let me just do this. Hold on just a sec. Question. What? So what I'd like you to do is, I, I, I just want to play around with this question. Uh, I want you to spend a few minutes just brainstorming the, this question. If you, were, if you were to join a full medical behavioral health care ACO, what could you do, what could you bring to the table to improve quality and reduce costs to sort of get our brains going around, around what you bring to the table? And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to step away for a couple minutes, start my stopwatch, and, and come back. And, and I want to hear what, what you came up with um, as a way to lead, lead into the, next, the last chapter for today. Thank you. I'll be, right, I'll be back in a few.
Why don't we reconvene now? And um, anybody want to toss out a couple ideas that you've discussed? Uh, yeah, this is Monk. I won't be shy. Oh, whoever else just started there can go. Go ahead. Thanks, Don. Um, so uh, we came up with like a, a kind of an answer to your question, which is um, the thing that we would provide or bring to the table for a full medical ACO would be, in one word, it'd, it'd be access, but it's specifically access to behavioral health specialty stuff. Um, so we obviously have a more robust um, prescriber group in our network because um, we have the volume, for lack of a better word, to support psychiatry and nurse practitioners who exclusively do that, full-time prescribers. Um, we have a robust peer counseling network. We do, we're the experts, at least some of the providers um, in connecting people with housing resources, support and employment. Uh, we have, you know, yeah. providers in peer counseling. We have providers in schools. We have providers in shelters. We coordinate with the jail very closely. There's even treatment providers in the jail now. So I think that will be very attractive to a hospital system or a primary care provider who currently may have behavioral health in their clinic, but it's for the people who are already showing up there, and it's pretty limited in scope. And I think that an MCO would be pretty interested in having um, a place that someone who's in the ED could be discharged to that had access to that stuff, because that stuff does not exist in Vancouver Clinic, for example. Um, so I think that's what we bring to the table, and and also uh, a home for low needs medical. So one of these medical entities could could place a physician or run a uh, a residency kind of a setup in in one of the clinics, one of our clinics for low needs medical, so the chronic conditions, um, so that so that their their access at their site. Um, they're getting more of the people who are their covered lives um, needs met who aren't showing up at their site, but they're already showing up at our clinics because they're more maybe attracted to the relational-based approach that uh, um, that you know we're sort of the experts on. Yeah. So the preventive end of the spectrum for those individuals treating, you know, early intervention for chronic conditions earlier rather than when they're showing up at a hospital. So I'll take I'll take I'll take the response off the air. Sounds great. I, lo I that's wow. I'm sold. Where where do I sign up? Don, did you want to add, a, add some stuff? I did. I I um, I'm here by myself, and so um, didn't have the benefit of uh, talking with others. I really liked what uh, Buck had to share. Um, maybe a couple of other highlights. I know we're very um, interested when we look at the, uh, if we looked at the ACO formula, I know the providers are very uh, interested in organizing and um, uh, coming up with, uh, you know, work groups, committees to, um, to ensure that we're collaborating as much as we can. Um, we definitely have that desire to focus on high quality patient-centered care. Um, and we want to build a, an infrastructure that supports all of us learning how to become and really focusing on um, behavioral health centers of excellence. And, and um, we've, we've, we've had discussions around uh, the, the importance and significance of that world-class customer service and making sure there, um, you know, lots of us have that um, wraparound background and, and training and, and system of care background and, and training where we know that it's really important to consumers, individuals, families, to have a sense of voice and ownership and, and um, that peer uh, development movement is strong within our community. Um, so we would be able to support that, that, that strong uh, care coordination uh, and would want to do that um, at CCS since I didn't have the luxury of discussing with other folks, some of the things that we do, but um, as well as the, the PACT and ACT teams, 
you know, we're structured to have um, the ability to work with those consumers that are identified as high utilizers that um, that may show up at the EDs, uh, the hospitals first, and and try and access care there. And so, from PACT and ACT and crisis stabilization and uh, the Wise services, we can work with consumers to do care coordination and and collaborate with all the multiple systems that are involved so that they can get what they want without accessing the most ex expensive um, form of treatment. Um, a number of our providers um, have that mobility to go where the consumer is, to intervene in the home, in the community. A uh, number of um, our providers through CST Level 3, PAC Act, uh, uh, WISE, we have that built-in crisis response. And so we've improved access and availability of services um, when families need us the most. Some of us have uh, contracts with health homes uh, or have the health home uh, contract. And so uh, we've begun uh, understanding how to um, pull, pull in um, even the medical primary care providers, connect with them, and trying to organize um, things and, and it's kind of like that, that hopeful that um, that idea of one all of these all, all of us working together but trying to get closer to one plan when you have that system uh, collaboration plan I don't know I'm rambling but those are a few thoughts that I thought of good other other comments Um, this is Kathy with um, Children's Home Society of Washington, and I think one of the other things um, that we can bring to the table as a network is some of us are also focused really on kind of the very front end of the system and working in research-based, evidence-based ways with young children um, that and their parents or caregivers in a way that um, from research is really showing can prevent um, deep end costs later in the system for health issues as well as behavioral health and chemical dependency issues. So I think we can make a case for, um, you know, investing up front and reducing some of those costs down the line. Where do I sign up? And, and I see that Joe wrote in that, um, that uh, our network includes two consumer advocacy groups, um, including NAMI and CVAB. Which are, which are really important um, uh, things to bring to the table. And, um, and then we've already become a health home CCO and have two care coordinators on staff, as Don was saying. Great. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Columbia River Mental Health has that too. Great. Good. So, so this is a great lead-in to the, uh, we're getting close to the end of our time. There's a few more slides that I want to talk about that to help um, to to, which are in the form of the next chapter, and then we'll talk about next steps. So, so uh, you, you, this is really fun because you've kind of already answered where does the safety net delivery system fit into this new ecosystem, and I want to paint a few brush strokes to underscore the importance of what you just told me. So, it starts with the simple question: What about at-risk, vulnerable populations? And it brings us to the social determinants of health, that there's a distinct relationship between an individual's health status and the social and environmental conditions in which he or she lives. And so we think about all these social determinants of health, and we think about a typical medical practice, a hospital, a primary care practice, a specialty clinic, medical specialty clinic, um, and what they know and have in place to address these kinds of issues. 
And so it, it really like creates a situation where Houston, we have a problem with a traditional medical ACO. There's a lot of press now about, there's two kinds of press that's coming out. There's a lot of press that's saying we're already bending the cost curve nationally, and it's pretty darned exciting. And But there's a lot of ACOs that aren't achieving the promise, and a lot of medical homes that aren't achieving the promise. And I'll tell you exactly why that second set of events is happening is because we have, um, for lots of kids, families, and adults in the state who had good health care, not enough, and these ACOs just have good health care. And so think about a mom with depression and diabetes, and some of you may have already seen this particular slide. Uh, add to the scenario that she's the head of a household of a family of three, she's lost her job, is experiencing domestic violence, and she's on, she and her kids are on the brink of homelessness. So what we're really talking about is a situation where um, there's a lot more going on with this family than what good primary care and specialty care will address. And so it requires the customization. I, I, I believe it absolutely requires the customization of the medical home and, and of the accountable care organization. And so if you look at this picture, um, we have this accountable care organization, uh, but we have um, the, one of the things that's different about this picture is that we have um, me a mental health and substance use agency with primary care embedded in it. We have social service agencies, education and employment, public housing, and public health, oral health, long-term care. We have a, we have, we're really trying to bring the health neighborhood into the ACO so that everybody, in next session we'll be talking about collective impact in more detail and talking about the importance of all this and talking about how this relates to it. But I believe that you cannot achieve the triple aim without an ACO that looks like this if you're dealing with folks that are in the safety net. And so Washington has already started working on this. So there's this idea of, of creating these early adopter regions with health plans and counties and local players working together. And I would suggest that they need to be working with so we're organizing the payers to create a supportive payment and regulatory system, but we also, but the goal is to use that to help support organizing of the delivery system to create accountable systems of care. So I use that in lowercase um, rather than uh, necessarily an A, capital A, capital C, capital O, but, I, but in some way, shape, or form, we have to have accountable systems of care, or this thing isn't going to work, which leads us to an idea that I, I think that this, what, where Washington State is headed, is not going to work unless the providers get organized in every regional service area in some way, shape, or form to be much more connected. And so part of what you're, you've hired me to help you do is to help you figure out how to get to this picture in southwest Washington. Because if the picture had all the payers organized at top and all the providers fragmented at the bottom, it wouldn't work. And so, you know, we're, um, what I'm saying here is where all the members of the safety net ACO are working together to provide integrated comprehensive whole person care, um, where all the members of the safety net ACO are centers of excellence in the respective field providing easy access, world class customer service, excellent outcomes, excellent values, all these dots start getting connected. And, and so I, I would suggest that equally important 
as the Southwest Washington RHA is working on becoming an early adopter and working, which includes the health plans, that the delivery system, um, what you, this is the core of what of the work that needs to happen. That's supported by that other side of the coin, that other parallel effort. So, uh, health management associates uh, wrote a paper a couple years ago called "Accountable Care and the Safety Net." And I want to touch on a few things. I'm going to go through the nine things, the nine steps that they have suggested for um, creating a safety net ACO as opposed to just a, a, an ACO for middle and upper middle class folks, if you will. Um, they start out, interestingly enough, saying someone has to step up and lead. And, and so, gosh, um, I think that's... Uh, an important piece of the puzzle. I'll say more about that in just a minute. Second, determine the geographic area to be covered by a safety net. Third, thoroughly understand target populations and communities, and then build a framework for how different providers could fit into an integrated delivery system. Bring that critical mass of providers into discussions about an ACO. Agree to move together in phases, but with a clear timeline. Involve the major payers of the safety net, including state and local governments that reimburse for the care of the Medicaid populations and, and the uninsured. Start by starting. Begin to act as a virtual ACO as the real one is being developed. And then finally, get help to build the infrastructure that will make the ACO a reality. So, so I would suggest that um, these night, however you go, whether you create a full meal deal ACO, a behavioral health ACO, a provider network that doesn't take risk, a provider alliance or affiliation that is a more informal version of a provider network, that, that these steps of working together um, continue, is relevant. And so I'm thinking about this, and I'm, and I'm thinking about the first five and I'm getting pretty excited as I'm putting these slides together yesterday because I go, oh, you know, this group sounds like a good place to start in terms of someone has to step up and lead. And we already have a defined uh, service area, which is the Southwest Washington Regional Service Area, the three counties that the state has already designated. We, um, excuse me just a sec. Just want to let you know that I'm on a webinar and the cam video cam's on. Um, in terms of thoroughly understanding the target populations and communities, you know a lot, and you've already demonstrated that. The RHA will be getting a grant to work on this in the first half of the year in terms of learning more about the health needs um, of the population. And building a framework for how different providers could fit into the system and bringing a critical mass. Uh, this, is, this is the work that's in front of us. It's the lead-in for our next meeting. And so we're just about out of time. Let me see if there's any other questions. Actually, I'm going to skip that because I want to... I wanna, um, Well, actually, that, let me just stop and ask um, a different, rather than having you, oh, <clears throat> so does it, <clears throat> are you, when you think about this list of nine and you think about the fact that you are already got the wheels turning, um, the question I want to ask you is, it sounds like you all are actually going in the right direction and, and working with us to help you move the ball down the field is exactly the right, is going to help you keep going in the right direction. I want to just do a little quick reality testing. Does it seem like uh, you guys have, are doing exactly the right thing and it's, <coughs> we're moving in the right direction? Do you have any sort of initial reactions or course corrections or speeding up that you think we need to do as you've thought about what we've talked about today? Let me just stop and see if you have any responses to that question. Hey, Dale, this is I would Brad. Agree. I think this, Brad, this 
like to say, you know, I'm on a smaller, represent one of the smaller organizations. I think there's a leaning forward, but there's like, we need to, I have the sense of we need to get going. And, um, to, you know, to either know we're in or we're not, but it just feels like somehow we need to do the work on our own, in between, but we've got to pick up the pace and make some tough decisions. But, you know, those are, and we're getting a lot of good information from you, but at some point we just got to, you want to, we got to act as if. And, and um, I just feel like a lot of us are leaning in, but we, we just got to start acting. And, and so specific steps we need to work out. Thanks, Brad. Other thoughts? Hi, Dale. It's Melanie. I just have concerns that maybe we're being a little bit arrogant and assuming that the primary care is going to be willing to do the things that we bring to them and say, hey, this is how we think it's going to work. I mean, I think we really need to have them at the table sooner rather than later so that we understand what their barriers are and what, what their concerns are, their hurdles or whatever they need to cross. That, that's what bothers me. I'm, I'm concerned we're just trying to build something without part of the architect. That, these are really great comments. And, and one of the one of the sixty four thousand dollar questions that we need to really focus on is um, is whether uh, um, is where, which of these two path you know generally well which path you're going to go down and, and what I'm hoping is that um, as we move. Uh, as we do the next webinar, and, and we have a face, -to -face we're, I'm planning on doing a face-to-face -face meeting, an extended meeting with you all uh, early um, in the new year, because I agree with you. Uh, not, you know, that's the perfect time to get rolling. So, um, you know, what we're going to do in the next webinar is we're going to talk about the less than filled meal deal options to consider. Uh, how does one decide which direction to take? Uh, I, what I think I want to do is do a webinar to start that rolling, follow it up shortly thereafter with a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, I, I'd like to do a half-day half day face face-to-face meeting because I think we need an extended amount of time. And, and I agree with you. These are the questions that we need to jump into um, answering the ones that you've just posed. Uh, uh, we need to do more than leaning forward. We've got to act as if we need specific steps to move forward on. And we need to have that conversation about is uh, behavioral health ACO the future or um, a misguided future that's not going to really get you to where you need to go. Um, and so um, our next steps are we're, we're um, Jennifer and Walter are going to lead the provider procurement and contracting work group. Uh, the state slowed down its feedback process, and we're going to fire this up after the new year, after New Year's. Um, working on partnership activities, uh, I just said, coming after you figure out the direction you want to take. We're going to be working on a readiness self-assessment uh, around in the internal pieces that's coming in January. Uh, we're going to be offering and providing individual agency and small group technical assistance that will come after the self-assessment results. And then, um, like I said, the face-to-face -face meeting is coming in January connected to the above activities. So I want to honor um, uh, the time. We're a couple minutes over. I, uh, as Joe said, I think uh, inviting uh, primary care folks um, to these discussions of getting them involved in the process is is a very realistic idea in terms of direction that you might want to take. And so we will um, move forward. And with that, I'm going to just um, call it a day. Thanks, everybody. Uh, have a great holiday. We will be letting you know when um, 